So, this is the biggest unboxing by a long shot. The Weekend to the Finger Lakes, Finger Lakes, New York has completed and with it came a lot of wine. A lot of great wine, a lot of great visits, a lot of great experiences. Some we had done in the past and just sort of revisited and tried different things and all were extremely successful. I think every winery visited had good wine, wine worth buying from, some obviously more outstanding than others. So I'm going to go through these as quick as possible. I'm probably going to have to pause in between because I can't fit, fit five and a half cases of wine on this bar. So I'm going to start with Shale Stone and I'm going to try to do them in groups here. It'll be much quicker and easier. So they're basic $20 red blend. I don't even know what's in it called Red Legend. Now <clears throat> the 20, I think these are all 21 vintage and the 20 vintage was a very ripe vintage up there. So the reds were more gutsy had more body these have a little less body for sure but we're still really good and really well made shellstone only makes reds so we got four of the red legend one pinot noir and let me combine two of what they call harmony which is a merlot cab franc cab sauve blend 60 30 10 so two of those Two Merlot. The Merlot for the 21 vintage, and I think these were 21. I'm not seeing a vintage on here immediately, but definitely you could see it in the percentage 12.6% alcohol. These were slightly lower body, but great acidity. These, these have the ability to age for a pretty long time, although I doubt they will last that long. This is called Synergy. I think this was one of more one of the more expensive ones. It's 50% Merlot, 33% Syrah, 17% Cab Sauve. Two of those, and then the Cabernet Sauvignon. So there's that case. I think the outstanding wines were the Synergy. Uh, Maybe the Cap saw me with the Merlot. I, I'm now probably blanking, but they were all definitely, definitely really good. To round out the case, we've got some other what we would call midweek wines, the Red Legend. So, all great stuff from Shellstone, and I will pull out the next case. In three visits to the Finger Lakes, struggled to find a sparkling. Riesling made in the champagne style <clears throat> where the bubbles develop in the bottle <coughs> <clears throat> but at Lamro this year this sparkling Riesling was awesome 2019 I think we got two or three of them a little bit of money $45 I think but fantastic <clears throat> in the dosage added three grams of sugar uh, per liter and I think that really mellowed out the acidity of some of these Rieslings. I think in the past some of the sparkling Rieslings were so acidic that they were difficult to really drink. This was really a sweet spot. So <clears throat> great stuff from Lamoureux Landing. The other three wines were all three of their single vineyard Rieslings which last time I only purchased the Yellow Dog two years ago. This time I liked all three of them for various reasons. These are all 2021 vintage, so they were pretty good acidity, but again, they added a little bit of residual sugar, and I think that really balances out the acidity in these in these years that are a little bit more challenging. They, they claim 21 was a bit of a more challenging, they call it a winemaker's year vintage. This is from the Red Oak Vineyard. This is from the Round Rock Vineyard, and in varying degrees of our res residual sugar, but none of them are sweet by any stretch. They're, they're dry. But slightly that, that edge of that acidity is that searing acidity is mellowed a little bit by the addition of the uh, residual sugar. And then this is Yellow Dog, which was pretty much the driest, but these were all pretty pretty dry. So those were the Lamoureux 
landing wines. And let's see if I'm in front of me, I have. Well, let me go into a box again. All right, so Forge Cellars we went to a few times, not because we did a tasting there, because they also sell all other wines. We had yet another Chateau de Cosme, Gigandas, Hominis Files, I think it's called, 2020. So a Southern Rhone blend, and it was fantastic. A little less bodied than the Le Clos 2019 from the year previous, but fantastic. We also had a really great champagne, I think, the next day. I only bought one one Riesling from them, the Kaywood 2021. And I did not do a tasting of Forge Rieslings this time around, maybe next time, but a great place to visit and great wines, great atmosphere. So that was definitely a, a winner there. Boundary Breaks was a new winery and we bought three. So there was a few Rieslings we, I liked, we liked. Extra Dry, What's the vintage? 21. This one was called Dry, so a little bit of residual sugar, also a 21. And they had a really nice rose. 2021 rose. I think it was made from Cab Franc, didn't really matter. I'd say that this one had this peaches and cream type of taste to it, which was nice. So if I get peaches and, I'm sorry, strawberry and cream out of any rose, I'm a big fan. I want it to be fresh, I want it to be strawberry like. I don't mind if it's light or not. I just want it to have a certain freshness and a liveliness to it. Some, ro I tried to age rose, or rose it was a 2020 from I think Standing Stone, 2020 or 2021. It's, it felt flat, felt dead. Their 2023 was fantastic. So I will actually go right on to them. Those were the three from Boundary Breaks, but from Standing Stone, looks like only two wines this, this year. Who also is partnered with Herman J. Weimer, but not all the Herman J. Weimer's wines are there. So this was a Herman J. Weimer 2022, and this was the flower something or other. Flower Day Riesling, really good, really nice. The best Riesling this year that we tasted from them, not the best Riesling. And they also had a rosé, and this is a really dark rosé, so Tinterrier. And it's made from the Saparavi grape. Saparavi being one of those grapes that's red on the outside, red skinned, and red fleshed, similar to La Conte Boucher. And they even call it that Tinterrier is the term for red fleshed and red skinned grapes. Most red grapes on the inside are white juice. These have red flesh. So those were the wines from Standing Stone. Two from Red Newt, and this is a 2013 Lahona, the Knoll, really great aged Riesling. Tried, I think, seven Rieslings from them. This was by far their best. Well rounded and everything else. This is a, the two, oldest one I could find in the store. I did not taste it, 2009 Lahona Vineyard. Doesn't have a specific, the Knoll, but got it anyway to try it out, as it was the oldest Riesling I could find from Red Newt. Red Newt did have some aged Rieslings. They're all pretty good. Didn't have the opportunity to be able to taste them all. Another new one at Water Vineyard. This is their 22 Cab Franc. I believe this wine for the price was pretty solid. Absolutely could be a weekend weekend drinker, but a really nice wine nonetheless for a Cab Franc. 22 being a little bit of a riper vintage, apparently not as ripe as 20 though. The 20 Reds out of the Banana Belt, that area in the east of Seneca Lake were so full body compared you just would you wouldn't even really realize it from sort of a cooler climate up there the 2022 dry riesling interestingly enough about this zero percent residual sugar about fully malolactic fermentation so young winemaker he's 28 years old and he's doing it a little bit different the wine felt tasted good felt well 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 balanced for having zero percent residual sugar which i thought was interesting and I expected it to have the searing acidity where it would just take the enamel off your teeth, but it did not. It actually was rounded enough because of the malolactic fermentation, turning that lactic acid into malic, and it and it worked out. So good job there. And they had a really nice rosé as well. 
2023 Cab Franc and Blau Francish, but it's 85% Cab Franc, mostly Cab Franc. Nice rosé. So a third rosé. Rosé is just the rosés up there. I think I, I feel like are getting better and better for a Riesling country. The rosés are are definitely becoming nicer. The next three were bigger, bigger purchases. I will go through Silver Thread. So Silver Thread bought a number of their Rieslings. And this is the 2022 Doyle Fournier Vineyard, so sort of a recent recent vintage of a Riesling from this single vineyard called Doyle Fournier. I think one of the older vineyards in the Finger Lakes, I think planted in the 70s, if I'm not mistaken. And something about Silver Thread, I, I swear to blind tasting with Rieslings from that region, I could pick out their Silver Thread, the, the young Silver Thread. They have this liminess, this key lime pie component that I can't, I do not detect anywhere else because it's just very prominent. Here is a 2014. So we did have a, a library vintage tasting in the tasting room and these 14s were showcased. This is a 2014 estate vineyard Riesling. It had, they, they showcased a Riesling with very little RS from 2014. This one had minimum, a meme amount and then one had a little bit more. I felt like this one was the most well balanced of the three, so I purchased that one. Twenty another four, 2014 didn't try this, but this is from the Gridley Bluff Vineyard. So 2014 Riesling from Silver Thread Single Vineyard. And this is 2014 from the Doyle Fournier. So very similar there. Another rose. So four roses. 2023. And I do not know what Pinot Noir. So Pinot Noir rosé. This is probably the lightest rosé. I'd say the most elegant, but still a really nice acidic rosé that kind of reminds me of a, a rosé from Provence, France. And this is a 2022 Gridley Bluff Vineyard current release. And last but not least, I asked for the oldest thing they had in the library room. They pulled out a 2020, 2012 dry Riesling. We did taste it. I thought it was great. We were in a room with some other people. I don't think they really agreed with me, but I thought the wine was fantastic and drinking really well and on the road to wasn't fully developed, but definitely more developed in the 14s and on its way to it was more developed. It was a little golder in color, more of the tertiary flavors than primary. 14 showed a little bit more primary, but you could tell how they were on that curve of, of aging as white wine does age really well, especially with high acidity. So two more wineries to go. So two more wineries were visited and that is where the majority of the wine was purchased. And I am already imbibing in a Sheldrake 2012 Riesling. Sheldrake being the next winery I'm going to talk about what was purchased. This one on its way to really nice development. I opened this yesterday. It was absolutely fantastic. It still is fantastic. The Sheldrake Rieslings age beautifully. And not only that, there were some other goodies bought from, from Sheldrake. So I'll start with this. The 2012, I guess, was a hotter year bolder year for red wines. This was a 2012 Cab Sauv Reserve from Sheldrake. It was a really nice aged red that didn't even taste that aged, but was fantastic. Here's a 2020 Cab Franc. So from that riper 2020 vintage, the reds really were showcased. The whites could be deemed a little bit flabby, although I felt like some of them really were well balanced to drink immediately. I don't think they would do well in the long haul. I believe their flabbiness and lack of acidity probably would hurt them, but they did have a roundness to them at as soon as they came out. When I tried them last year, when I tried them in 23, the 2020s were tasting pretty nice, but round, and I don't know if they would be very age-worthy, but enjoyable in the moment. So this was a 2020 Cab Franc. Another 2012 Cab Sauve. So two of those, liked it enough. 2020 Meritage, so this is a blend of, I don't know, don't remember, but we'll just move on. 2020 Meritage from Sheldrake. Another 2020, 2020 Meritage. 
2020 cab franc. So those were the reds. I'm going to grab all of the whites. So for the whites from Sheldrake, I just started clearing house on anything old. The did a tasting of it, probably about 20 wines there. Any dry Riesling that was old and tasted good was an automatic purchase. So there's gonna be a lot of duplicates here. 2011 dry Riesling from, from Sheldrake there. 2016 Riesling Reserve. This was, this was also pretty nice on its way to developing into a really nice wine. Another 2016. 2012 dry Riesling Reserve. There'll be a very obvious pattern here. 2012. That one, yep, dry Riesling and 2012 Riesling. And the difference between the dry Riesling and Riesling, I think these these have a little bit more RS. And this even says medium sweet, but they weren't medium sweet by any stretch. I tasted them because of the age. The what the sweetness becomes over time with these wines, as I've noticed, is more integrated into the body of the wine. So is, was this 2012 dry or not dry? This one just standard. And I can say that if this claims medium sweet, it's nowhere near medium sweet. The the high residual sugar from its inception to now, 12 years later, has just turned into body. Maybe a smell of honeycomb on the nose, but there's no to find, there's no a sweetness on the palate. It's got a roundness. City is still right there, and it's on its it's on its curve to almost fully develop, but still developing. Really great, God, that is exceptionally good. That is an absolute sweet spot for me right there. It's right between fully developed and over that hump of. It's starting to get more tertiary and dried fruits. 2011 dry Riesling. 2011 Riesling, so a little bit more RS. 20, 2009, so they had a few 2009s. I tasted these, these were fantastic. Probably between the nines and 11s, I don't remember which was my favorite, but they were fantastic. 2011. And I think there might have been one more 2009. There was one more 2009. So I cleared them of all 2009 and 11 Rieslings. They no longer have any in their wine room. Maybe they have some more in their library. But from a st this standpoint, I just went to town on we went to town on the older Rieslings. I tried their Chardonnay. It didn't taste old enough. I think it was a 14 or 13. One of my favorites was the 01. But that thing was so well developed that it was one of my favorites from Sheldrake ever. So that is that one more winery to go. I almost forgot and this would have been a shame. So in the Finger Lakes, and this is sort of happening, byproduct of whatever you want to call it, but the climate shift and the warming in the general area, you're seeing less and less ice wine. There used to be this thing about going up the Finger Lakes, oh, you must be buying ice wine, drinking ice wine. There's very little ice wine to buy. And this is a 2020 current vintage ice wine, and it was very good, very good. It'll be a nice Father's Day gift, lower alcohol, good acidity, good sweetness. It was fantastic. But then, take it up a notch to this, uh, probably the best ice wine I've ever had. 2002, 22 year old ice wine. It pours amber. It it reminds me of Madeira or or Tawny Port. It's fantastic. A little bit of caramel, a little bit of toffee. It's the best ice wine I've ever had. And if, unfortunately, you got to pay for it, but. It's got the 20 something years on it, which really, really evolved it into something special. So it's only a half bottle too. So the cost of this stuff, but making ice wine is extremely expensive. So those were the last two from Sheldrake. I'd, I'd be remiss not to mention those. So one winery left, let's clear some of this space. So like I mentioned overall, a very good trip. There was not 
too many wineries in one day. There was enough time in between. There was enough time to try numerous wines. I spit them all out. Very tiny sips that maybe I consumed over time, but made sure that my palate was ready and cleansed for the next winery just to give myself enough of an opportunity to, to actually taste all these wines because we were tasting through a lot of them, a, a large volume of wine, and I don't have a final count. Experiences are sometimes everything. Experience, environment, company. The Silver Thread Vintage Tasting Room experience was fantastic. We were in there with some other people. It was great. It was fun. It was awesome to talk with the owner, talk with the people there. So, fantastic experience with Sheldrake. No one else to talk to except the purveyor of that tasting and the library tasting, but it was a great experience. Tried through many, many wines and obviously bought the most wine I bought from Sheldrake because they did have all those aged whites, which was my one of my primary focuses going up, or in my mind, I'm gonna buy as much 2000, the older the better, but those ones that taste fully, almost fully developed are really on the other end of not just developing, but closer to developed and between developing and developed, that, that sweet spot. So if I found those, I was buying as many as they possibly had, almost regardless of price. The best experience was probably at Damiani overall. Spent the most amount of time there. Bought another 12 bottles from, from them, mostly red, just because that is some of the wines we tried mostly. It's not that I didn't want any more whites, but if I wanted some reds, and they happened to have a lot of 2020 reds left, where a lot of other wineries did not. So because of that, there was a fair bit of red bought from Damiani. I will go through the non-reds here first. Bought this last year, but it's the 2010 Brut. This, this champagne style, this is fantastic. And I'm pretty sure it's mostly Pinot Noir in the blend, but with the age and everything about it, they we tasted the 14. I remember the 10 being better than the 14 from my memory. So it's like as soon as I saw this on the menu, I said, don't worry about the 14, which I did like. But we both liked it. Let's go with the 2010. So that's how that got added. I'm trying to find the other white in here. Struggling up oh, there it is. I bought whatever the oldest Riesling they had didn't taste it 2012 dry Riesling from the Davis Vineyard one of the oldest vineyards in Finger Lake sometimes named other things and some of the other Wineries, but is that Davis Vineyard one of the oldest so Excited to try that at some point the rest Look like red and I'm gonna categorize it because I know there's a lot of doubles in here don't want to be overly redundant so let's go with the age 2014 Cab Franc tasted this this was fantastic still has a lot of youth the acidity's there it's ready to drink it could go a little longer but really awesome 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 Cab Franc you really can't make Cab Franc much better than than some of these we're tasting on the heels of that 2020 Cab Franc fantastic Bolder than the 14, great flavor, just awesome. No greenness, nothing. This is the 2012 Pinot Noir. This was fantastic. Bought the 2011 last year, was amazing. This was even better, a little bolder, but still aging beautifully. Really nice Pinot Noir, good acidity. I, I always wanna buy more Pinot when I'm up there. It just doesn't happen. Most of the Pinots are so, so, so light. They almost look like rosé. This feels and acts like a Burgundian Pinot or an Oregon Pinot, more so than California, but that's what it reminds me of and, and that's what it kind of went for. Where so many other ones up there were just so, so, so light that they just didn't have enough character to be interesting enough to drink. We didn't go to Heart and Hands, which I think has some of the best Pinots in the Finger Lakes. It's just too far from where we were staying. They have this wine called Mokushla, which is fantastic. 2020 Merlot was awesome, got two of those. And then of the 2020s, the Cab Sauv was fantastic. Really, really great wine. And unfortunately, none of these reds were cheap. So Damiani's reds are a little bit on the higher end of price, but well worth these. the prices of these wines were 
great. We did try 2022 soft Robbie, was solid, just didn't compare it to these to make the cut. The best red wine was a 2012 Cab Sauv Barrel Select. I did ask if they had a 2010, so one of the best red wines, the best red wine I've ever had from the Finger Lakes was a Damiani 2010. They didn't have it in there in the winery. It might be in the cellars that were off premise, but we did taste the 2012. This was the most expensive red of the trip and at Damiani, but it was fantastic and aging really, really nice. Instead of being all the bright, big black and blue fruits, it had some herbal and some truffle and some some cedar and some licorice it was just a really really great after just tasting it i was like wow that is awesome and that is aging awesome so those were the 12 from from damiani did pretty good at 26 minutes but a great trip probably bought way too much wine i think with some of the wine clubs and things that were signed up for probably won't buy as much next time maybe go for some experiences i'm starting to see a bit of a trend of the ones that are cognizant enough to keep a library versus some other wineries that aren't but there's definitely the vintage is up there there's vintage variation the reds of 21 were nowhere near as unctuous as the Reds of 20. Now that's expected. 22 even claim was a very hot drought vintage, but that 2020 must have been a really perfect season for them. I hear 2012 was great in 2010. You'll know, find a whole heck of a lot of that, but you'll notice that Damiani and Sheldrick had some 2012s and we did purchase some of those Reds as they did. They were tasting really well and they were aging really well. So really good stuff, really great trip. Couldn't recommend the area more very chill very relaxed uh, you never really feel rushed they're always willing to give you more let you try more especially if you're really going to buy especially if you're interested some of the wineries just go they pour they walk away they don't really care some will get more engaged with you some is just personality of the people but if you spend your time get to know the wines get to know the winery what they're doing what they're not doing and sort of establish a relationship and maybe do these vintage tastings or slightly higher price tasting the, the, none of these are expensive tastings some are a little bit more money but not extensive from what i'm hearing at Napa, the prices of the winery tastings now are, are astronomical and really it's becoming a problem hopefully they resolve it so but just hanging out at forge to have a plate of cured meats and some cheese and that gigantas and then the next day sitting in the sun with the champagne from france you know, taking a little bit of a break from the Riesling, but just having a fantastic Premier Cru champagne under the sun with this plate of meat and cheese was just a, an amazing experience sitting outside, talking to a father and his daughter about wine, about the Finger Lakes and the area and the wineries they visited, the wineries we visited. Just very neighborly, very nice, and a great experience. Feels like a happy place for me. Look forward to the next trip. I always am very relaxed during those days. And then returning home, reality sort of hits you very quickly. But great memories. Video, this video sort of memorializes what was purchased, but really can't replicate the experiences, the time, uh, the fun, the laughs, the food, great restaurants. Or not a ton of restaurants, but the ones we visited were were good. We enjoyed them. Even the places for lunch, found some better lunch spots. Enjoyed everywhere we went for lunch. And that's it. Have a good night.